Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special town hall. We wish to acknowledge that the land on, on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The territory on which Concordia University of Edmonton is located provided a traveling route and home to the Cree, Blackfoot, and Métis, as it did for the Nakoda, Tsutina, Chippewan, and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. And this town hall is also about this today. I would like to thank uh, all of you who came here and also a special welcome to our special guests from the steering committee, from the board, from so many other places that are with us here today. Uh, a class starts here at 1 p.m., so we need to be out of the auditorium by then. <laughs> to present to you the five occupant crews of the star vessel CSRI, Center for Science, Research and Innovation. This enterprise started just over a year ago when Concordia submitted an application to the federal government for funding for this new project on our special call for infrastructure and capital funding. Barely over 13 months ago, uh, there was only grass where now stands the building. The federal government has given us $6.7 million on a $16 million state-of-the-art building. This mission is now starting to explore new worlds, to seek out new life interactions and civilizations interactions for a better world, to boldly go where no one has gone before, with 97 years of history, Concordia University of Edmonton is launching this CSRI enterprise towards the future to be at the heart of Canada's preeminent smaller university. We have named this campaign to build this enterprise Accelerate. Concordia invites partners to join the $5 million Accelerate campaign and become stewards in the advancement of innovation in our city and beyond. The impact of the center will extend into future generations of thinkers and innovators. The fuel propelling this new academic research and technological enterprise is a potent energy combined made of interdisciplinarity and creativity. It combines the strong roots of our land in with, with its indigenous wisdom and presence. Now being rediscovered and reintegrated in healing approaches. The augmented reality laboratories for better public and environmental health. The clinical health treatments for the people's psychological and social integrity. The testing and creating capacities for life and the elements of the world capable of improving human life, the labs and the integration of university knowledge, community, industry, and economy for a better world, the CIER. This all with a pulsing heart in the middle of the building, populated with students, with professors, and entrepreneurs, partners and friends, the design thinking space. So, Jupiter and beyond the infinite? 
I don't think so. Rather, the buffalo moon rising and beyond. This is where we start with a solid reach back to our roots with the Canadian civilization, civilization who thrived on this soil and land. Where we are built on. Education is the new buffalo and the way ahead and beyond for meaningful human life. So the five occupant crews of the CSRI enterprise who will now be working very closely with the students and the community are the following. The Indigenous Knowledge and Research Center, Buffalo Moon Rising, the Public Health Simulation Lab, the Institute for Psychology Research and Services, Faculty of Science Research Labs, and the Center for Innovation and Applied Research. Each of these crew representatives will present to you how they will be helping in, in steering this vessel propelling Concordia forward. But not only Concordia, propelling Edmonton, Alberta and Canada, producing independent thinkers, ethical leaders and citizens for the common good. This is, this is in, in a mix of students, of alumni and partners locally, nationally and globally. So, the new Concordia, secular, inclusive, public in outlook, strong in creative and ethical leadership, with this state-of-the-art CSRI, will have a growing presence in Edmonton and beyond as we prepare to start our second century of existence in 2021. The presentations today are in Pecha Kucha format, uh, meaning that they have 20 slides with 20 seconds each set automatically, and each presentation of six minutes and a few seconds. So enjoy the trip and we'll have the questions after the presentations. We will start now with uh, Mr. Louis Cardinal, for the uh, Center for Indigenous Research. Thank you very much. Can you? There we go. Great. Perfect. Wonderful. I'm just happy I'm not wearing a red sweater today. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everyone for being here, of course, and I need to find my... Uh, so here we are. Okay. So, PC challenged. <clears throat> Do I just hit this one? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Change is the constant in nature. Nature teaches us that relationships are key, and it's what keeps everything held together. From nature, we human beings learn that we too must strive to maintain good relations with others by creating space to share and to learn. For Concordia University of Edmonton, the Indigenous Knowledge and Research Center in, uh, is our space for sharing and good relations. In the era of reconciliation, it is critical that we create these spaces of peace, friendship, and understanding, which are the core of treaty relationships in Canada. More than a space to gather, we see it as a resource and repository of indigenous knowledge, ways of learning to support the common goals of uh, research and relationship development in the spirit of the ancient gathering place where the city was born, and it's not too far from here. This will become our pehonan, our gathering place, our waiting place, a place of ceremony, culture, and a bridge between worlds. The center is a vision that was created by indigenous peoples connected to Concordia, the indigenous community, the Concordia indigenous community here to address a number of issues, but primarily to create a space and a place where indigenous people can see themselves reflected. The community voice also recommended that we provide a home base for a, a director, administrative support and staff to support students, to support an elders council, to support an indigenous cultural program so that we can share that with the people that are here and a space to celebrate indigenous celebrations and also achievements. The community, the uh, indigenous support also extends to supporting indigenous cultures, cross-cultural relationships and cultural awareness, and perhaps most importantly, a place where indigenous students can see themselves 
reflected and embraced in an environment that acknowledges their ancestors and acknowledges who they are. The center will serve as a focal point to help integrate and support indigenous-based research activities, connecting ourselves with the Center for the Innovation and, and Applied Research, the Institute for Psychological Research and Services, the Public Health Simulation Labs, and the other labs that the faculties use across the campus. By keeping that spirit of walking together in peace, friendship, and understanding as a practice and not a theory, because we are all treaty people, and we are relatives, and that's what the treaties teach us, is that we walk side by side like brothers and sisters, sharing the bounty of this land, sharing what it is that we know with each other. And then the center becomes that resource and reference center. It'll contain information in the form of documentations, uh, photographs, books, videos, recordings. It'll contain cultural artifacts that will support learning and research. It'll provide comfortable space for indigenous students to come, but any student to come, just to connect and to rest. But also to provide space for learners to access indigenous leaders and community members for counsel, mentoring, advice and guidance, like working with elders on a regular basis. It'll serve as that focal point for the local urban indigenous community in efforts of research, understanding our time in this place. And as a meeting and gathering place, it will be an informal space where uh, uh, learners can gather and learn from each other as well. Formal and informal meetings gathering up to about 30 or 40 uh, persons including, for example, talking circles, cultural training sessions and students, faculty and staff, and community discussions. It'll be a place for, for us to gather to really have that openness and that connection because space and place is very important for indigenous people to connect. But we also know that that is the place where we can grow relationships to support each other. It will become a two-way bridge for the community. And as a ceremony and culture of place, it'll be a place in which, where we can gather with industry leaders and also with, uh, with our education partners to share with each other and where we feel connected once again with, with each other. Today, as we move forward with this vision, we walk together in that spirit of wellness. We want to share our, our knowledge. We want to share the abundance that we have in, in our culture. We want to be able to practice that tradition of good relations in our community here. And we can see ourselves here. And we honor that space that has been created for indigenous people for the first time. But we also want to acknowledge that it'll be a place where we acknowledge the location of Treaty 6 territory, but most importantly, honors the spirit and intent of Treaty 6. As well, it honors all other treaties across Alberta and Canada, but also the unique relationships we have with the Métis and the Inuit people. The Indigenous Knowledge and Research Center becomes that safe place, that good place, a place of abundance where Indigenous students feel connected to the world today, but also with their people's histories and their people's dreams. And as wise elders from the North had once shared with us, they said, that we must become strong like two people. We, meet, we must learn the ways and the skills of the modern world and to hold on to who we are. These are visions that all of our treaty makers had carried with them, to be able to sit side by side with our new relatives and become a person of today, but rooted in the wisdom and the knowledge of the past. And from that, we can build a stronger and better future. The Indigenous Center in Concordia will be that strengthening place, much like the ceremonies of old, where a person can prepare to become their dream and the community to become its potential. The sky is the limit when we do this in the good way. Indigenous students and communities will come to Concordia because it is practicing good relations, providing the proper support to make relationships flourish, and because it is willing to walk with its indigenous partners towards a future as brothers and sisters. Again, back to those values and those principles. But first, we must always turn to Mother Earth and remember the lessons that she's given us, that it's all about relationships. 
because that is truly the great mystery that really holds everything together. I hi. Thank you, Mr. Carlo. I now invite Dr. Sandra Song to present the Dynamic Simulation Labs. Thank you very much for that introduction. And Louis Cardinal, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I'd like to say hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Song, as uh, has been announced, and I'm the director of the public health department here at Concordia University of Edmonton. I'm here today because I want to share my vision of the simulation lab. And you're probably wondering, what will be in this simulation lab? So today, we will uncover and discover what will be happening in the simulation lab. For me, I'm very excited to share this vision with you because it will bring together the training of public health professionals to the next frontier. And as you can see from the introduction today, we are about crossing different frontiers. So, the Public Health Simulation Lab is a key institute in the Center for Science, Research and Innovation. And it will enable students and faculty to bring their research to the community by providing real-life conditions in a 3D simulated or mixed reality environment. The S-Lab is the first of its kind in Canada to focus on public health training and research using 3D visualization. It will take the practice of public health to that next frontier by pushing innovation forward and harnessing our imaginations through cutting-edge technology. The S-Lab will create 3D simulations of facilities and scenarios for the training of students enrolled in the environmental health program as well as our future occupational health and safety program. The intent here is to enhance learning and public health practice through 3D visualization and hands-on experience by using mixed reality. You're probably wondering, how can this be done? First and foremost, we need the dedicated space. So thank you so much, <coughs> President Mormon, for that space. Uh, next, it requires cutting-edge technology and research equipment. But most important of all, it's the people with imagination that will drive this research and practice to the next level. So it means going beyond traditional methods and exploring new frontiers in research and training. Now, what is mixed reality? Mixed reality is the result of blending the physical world with the digital world. So we may have Kate Moss, you may have Pokemon, but we're gonna hopefully have a bit more than that, public health inspectors, all right? It is that next evolution in human, computer, and environment interaction. And it will unlock possibilities that before now were only restricted to our imaginations. Mixed reality is made possible by advancements in computer vision, graphical processing power, display technology, and input systems. We're now able to unleash the power of our imaginations and create 3D simulations for everyone to experience. Mixed reality will revolutionize training for our students here at Concordia University. They'll be able to experience real-world situations in a safe, controlled environment. This means that we can create virtual environments that will help our students improve their skills, their knowledge, and their competence to protect the health of Albertans. Also, mixed reality will take us to that next level of training, of research and practice as well. Now, in my department, for example, in, we train students to become public health inspectors or environmental health officers. And some of you may think that we only inspect restaurants, but we do way more than that. In terms of environmental health, we are responsible for health protection, and they are there to protect our health. So we are, or they are concerned with all aspects of the natural and built environment. But what do you mean by natural and built environment? Well, I'm referring to the quality of our air, 
the quality of our water, the quality of our soil, and our food. And also, we protect the public facilities, such as rental buildings, swimming pools, shopping malls, daycares, and schools that we inhabit in our daily lives. We want to make sure that they're safe. So mixed reality will prepare my students for areas previously considered dangerous and risky, and it will help them to improve their responses and judgment to address these situations effectively and efficiently. Of course, it will also help them to do so with confidence. That's what's key. So as we know in real life, every decision and every second counts in an emergency or crisis situation. It wasn't too long ago that we actually experienced the wildfires in Fort McMurray. We came together as a community to help those. As well, we had experienced the floods in southern Alberta. Now what I'm hoping to do is that with the EHOs who were at that front line, the first responders, what we're hoping to do is to ramp that up even more so by better training. And so what we hope to do is to prepare for the future using and investing in the simulation lab. We're going to do this by investing in advanced training in 3D visualization. This training involves creating 3D visualizations from the most mundane situation to the most risky and the most dangerous. We are creating those safe spaces. And the key equipment that will be used in this research lab will be the Microsoft HoloLens. As you can see, the HoloLens is a headset with transparent lenses, and it allows the user to see the world around them, but overlays that world, that physical world, with virtual 3D objects. But unlike virtual reality, it will allow the user to interact with their environment. And for my students enrolled in the environmental health program, and our future occupational health and safety program, the students will be able to conduct virtual examinations and inspections of spaces that can either be dramatically enlarged or reduced and can be inspected virtually through the S lab. Now using this unique technology in the programs will place Concordia at the forefront to improve public health protection. With this initial investment in the S lab, our university is demonstrating that an academic institution is listening to the needs of industry and listening to the needs of our government partners. It also demonstrates the importance and need to create strong partnerships. We cannot do this alone. Rather, we need to have strong partnerships between government, industry, and the education sector because we should be all committed to training better public health professionals. And through these partnerships, Concordia will become a center of excellence in public health. Now in fact, we're the only school among the six accredited in Canada to do this type of research and training in environmental health. And training in the SLAB will ensure Concordia will create a globalized workforce that will meet the needs of Canada and beyond by training individuals to be global thinkers and global workers. And in the spirit of global partnership and collaboration, the S-Lab will become an influential partner and meeting place for our network of international scholars. Countries like China, Brazil, Japan, and Portugal are challenged by wicked public health problems, just like Canada. And what we're hoping to do is to bring these scholars together to conduct their research and training at the S-Lab. So I hope this vision I shared with you inspires you uh, to get involved with the Public Health S-Lab. And as well, it will take a community of scholars and a community of visionaries to make this happen. So I encourage you, please join me and make this happen and support the Accelerate campaign. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sandra Song. Now I now invite Dr. <coughs> Fazad Zareb Bawani to present us our psychological things.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Farzad Zarabawani. I'm Associate Professor of Psychology here at Concordia University of Edmonton. Uh, and uh, I'm here on behalf of my colleagues to share with you the vision of um, our uh, uh, new institute. I'm sorry if I'm disoriented. I was just being beamed down by Scotty, so I was, <laughs> I was in the middle of a discussion with Dr. Spock, you know, and I got beamed down. So you have to be patient a bit with me, but I will get on with it without much ado. Uh, as I said, I am here to uh, present you our vision of an Institute of Psychological Research and Services, IPRS. But let us first start with some statistics about mental illness for us to kind of orient ourselves. Uh, you may not know, but uh, a, a large uh, part of our population today is actually impacted by mental health. Roughly about 25% uh, of our population today is suffering from mental illness. 8% of um, our teenagers are suffering from depression, 8% of them suffering from anxiety. About 500,000 Canadians uh, uh, on a given day cannot make it to work, and about 11 Canadians a day actually lose their lives to suicide. The cost of that is $50 billion annually to our economy. That's a huge cost. Our answer to this situation is, in fact, this uh, institute. Our institute, in a sense, is the way that we wish to uh, create our own homegrown response to this uh, public health challenge. We recognize that without coming together and without working together as partners within community, we cannot deal with this issue. Uh, our first attempt is to bring together, in fact, areas of research, development, and teaching and bring them under one roof. That would allow us to uh, create programs. That would allow us, in a sense, to combat that uh, statistics of neglect. You should know that only one out of every five people diagnosed with mental illness actually receives any help. This is what I call the statistics of neglect. For us, it's very important as a university that in the era of accountability uh, and uh, responsibility, we create our own response to this lack within our community. Our center, in fact, is uh, designed as such uh, that it would be able to host a number of activities simultaneously. Uh, research, development, assessment, service uh, pro uh, provision, as well as areas of teaching and development, they all come together, allowing our staff and our students to work creatively with high need sectors of the community. In this center, and with its revolutionary design, we have recognized that the very structure of the building uh, defines many of the activities and outlook of the staff and the people who are being served. This is why we have tried to, in fact, bring aesthetic aspect as well as functional aspect together in order to create a sense of optimism, hope for people who are coming in and for our students, faculty, staff, and supervisors who are coming from our partner organizations to be able to work with us creatively within the, these rooms, within these um, structures. This uh, simulation photos are, of, of course, uh, show uh, a kind of uh, uh, setup that we intend to create for our testing or for our uh, therapy uh, in installations. This is an, a play therapy room with an observation chamber that would allow us to actually look and see and observe the interaction of a um, parent and a child um, in high need and be able to actually provide a number of programs for families that are uh, planning to visit us. At the end of the day, we have a responsibility to establish a new cycle for those in need. We think that that cycle should start with us building new capacities and then passing that new capacities to our community 
to our children to create resilience. And that can happen only if we work in research and in development and in teaching together. Mental health can, in fact, be remedied if we all come together and if we all work together uh, collaboratively. However, if we cannot put together that approach of collaborativeness and hope, what will take place is a cycle of hopelessness and despair. And that is something that we are witnessing today more and more. This is something that has to stop. We cannot lose uh, our young ones and our resources to mental illness in our society with the present level of uh, resourcing and with present level of uh, capability, knowledge, we are very well equipped to in fact manage this problem creatively together and as one uh, force united and uh, well prepared. For this we have to of course work together and use our resources in order to be able to start with programs that are looking to detect problems in advance, have the capability or the capacity to promote mental health within community by, by the means of uh, targeted public uh, education campaigns, and then lead on to early detection and early intervention spectrum for those who are mostly impacted. We cannot miss anyone. We cannot allow anyone to be left behind. Our mandate is in fact to make sure that our program become the harbinger of change within this province for that kind of approach. In the area of assessment, for example, we are facing a challenge today. Many of our young ones do not get enough uh, assessment uh, in advance. Our screening procedures are in fact not covering many of our children within a school system. Our task is to use our resources to in fact make a contribution in that area. Khalil Gibran, a Lebanese poet, once said that a drop holds the secret of all oceans. In a drop of water, he saw something of that boundless energy of life. Today, of course, I think that we are all ripples. We are all ripples. And like ripples, we hold the secret of a mighty wave. We can come together and as a mighty wave, change the entire landscape of mental illness, at least in our city and in Alberta. Then we can say that there would be a sea change in our province. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farzad Awani. I would like to now invite Dr. Patrick Kamau to present the Science Labs. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Concordia University of uh, Edmonton. As uh, the speakers before me have uh, said, we are on this journey to um, talk to about, uh, about the Center for Science, Research and Innovation. And as you might well know, when you take a voyage, then you need uh, vitamin C. And uh, as the old sailors, they had to take some vitamin C and therefore I will talk a little bit about um, the, for the CSRI spaceship, the vitamins that they'll need on this um, journey. A fortnight ago, Elder Will Campbell told us that when we listen to a story, we remember it most if we associate it with something, and therefore, here is my story. Last month, I met a gentleman at uh, Phoenix Airport, and when our uh, flight got delayed, he started talking to me about uh, oranges and uh, that he had eaten in uh, Mesa, Arizona, 
and I would have forgotten about him, but when I came back to Concordia, Dr. Sandra Sol spoke about uh, oranges and lemons she saw back in Portugal. And then I thought, here is my story for today. Grapefruits, oranges, lemons, limes, ETC, all have limonene. And limonene is the compound that are, is responsible for their smells and are, they are characteristics, but yet they are different. The same can be said to be true of the laboratories in the CSRI. And in the Faculty of Science, there are four areas that uh, we work on. We have the Department of uh, Biology and Environmental Sciences, the Department of Mathematical and uh, Physical Sciences, and the Department of uh, Public Health. And of this, the, the laboratories in the basement, and if I may use this a little pointer here, is at this corner, we have environmental science with a, a space for 10 researchers. This area is the science um, laboratories for biology with a space of about 20 uh, researchers. And we have over here the chemistry with a space for 15 researchers. Along the edges of that building, we have near to Concordia, what are referred to as research offices, i.e. you have an office and a research space. And in, in here, we have our research spaces that we are going to cultivate our ideas, that we are going to get together and uh, ultimately uh, produce the project. As you may very well know, in gardening, we need the tools. And also, in the CSRI, we will need um, the instruments and apparatus to be able to carry out the project. And to just name a few, we do need spectrophotometers, we need uh, plate counters, we need um, all those. I'll start with my biology laboratory, and uh, the fruit before you is a pomelo. A pomelo is the largest citrus fruit, and why did I choose biology for the largest fruit, uh, citrus fruit? Because biology is the department which has most students in our faculty of science. So they get to get the biggest fruit or the largest fruit. And we have uh, to bring in those uh, pomelos, uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Hemling and Dr. Medina Janowicz. Dr. He Deborah Hemling is uh, working on um, streptococci pneumonia. So maybe stay away from her, whatever she is. <laughs> she is. And uh, Dr. Meriola Janowicz is working on uh, fish ecology, um, usually with a West Rope car cut -rot. In the environmental science uh, layer more things, uh, oh, I chose the grapefruit for them. And, and why the grapefruit? Because the pomelo is the ancestor for the grapefruit. And this is in the same um, department Then uh, I chose that uh, for, the, for them. The researcher in um, the Department of uh, Environmental Science is Dr. Zin Chen, and he works on uh, population ecology and plant physiology. So, and remediation and uh, um, assessment of uh, reclaimed um, lands. So, as we move on, this is the a funny fruit. This is it's still a citrus fruit. It is still one of the, those oranges. It's a Buddha's hard orange. And I chose the chemistry program for the Buddha's hard orange because in chemistry we have all different areas in organic, organic, um, physical, analytical, and then they have subdisciplines. So this was a fitting fruit for that. And we have Dr. John Washington, Dr. Owen Skadden, and Dr. Tom Tefosugu to um, lead this research in our chemistry area. Dr. Washington works with uh, nanoparticles. Uh, Dr. Skadden works on uh, total synthesis, and Dr. Tovolsku works a little bit uh, outside the, um, the laboratory on pedagogy of chemistry and mathematics. For mathematics, I was uh, torn between do I choose a mango for them or do I choose a, an orange for them? I settled on this fruit. It's called a mango orange because <laughs> it's still an orange, it's still a citrus fruit, but also it has a mango taste. So 
uh, Dr. Andreas Gusler and uh, Dr. Professor Bill Fried. Dr. Gusler works on uh, carbonatrix and uh, Dr. Bill Fried works on uh, enhancing calculus from science, uh, business, and uh, engineering. For public health, as we all know, limes and lemons, they have a, they have a patch to them. And in public health, we have the after degree program and the public health uh, certificates, which have a punch to them. And therefore, I thought it was fitting to have the limes and uh, lemons for uh, our public health department, which has the two. Dr. Sandra Song, uh, the director for public health, works on related areas in making uh, sure that uh, the elderly and the vulnerable populations have a uh, food security and, um, and also works with uh, indigenous people and, uh, in the reserves to make sure that um, their concerns are looked at. Lastly but not least is that we have a few science minors. These are the standalone science minors and we have tangerines, clementines, mandolins and so on for our science minors and to, because they are, they, are, they are small and they are sweet, and uh, to, <laughs> to take um, those into account, I have doctors uh, Zoltan Bertz and uh, Rosista Manlova, and Dr. Zoltan Bertz works on uh, lasers and uh, pauses. Dr. Rosista works on uh, enhancing uh, computer um, generated uh, frontiers. Um, in Limoni speak, all those, they are all related, they are all the same, they all have the same uh, basic idea, but in Limoni speak, then when they rotate the right to the left, then uh, this is the left hand side, then we'll say level rotatory Limoni, and when they rotate it to the right, we'll say dextral rotatory Limoni, and when they come in the middle, which has most of the audience here, we say, ethnic mixture. I would like to add up here and say that next time you go to a grocery store, next time you see uh, a citrus fruit, please remember the Science Research Laboratories at Concordia. <laughs> because that's uh, the message I would like us to take from here. Thank you so very much and I hope that you are going to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamau. Now, as the last presentation we have, we invite Mr. David Burry to present our Center for Innovation and Applied Research, who is, who is managing in, in relating all this research done at Concordia to the communities, to the industry, to the partners out there. After this, we have a few questions that we can ask with the President. So thank you very much for my effort, and uh, thank you to all my colleagues who've done some uh, wonderful presentations here, and I will never look at a, an orange the same way again. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, spend some time with you today and talk about the Center for Innovation and Applied Research at uh, Concordia University of Edmonton. And from this point on, it's a whole lot easier to say C-I-A-R, so that's the way you, you'll hear from this point on. So. Again, hello and welcome. My name is David Burry, and I manage, as Manfred mentioned, the, uh, the CIAR. So the function of the center is to provide a coordinated approach uh, for connecting multi-departmental research activities to external stakeholders. The mission of the CIAR is to advance industry and community interests by building and strengthening relationships and connections between CUE and external partners, turning knowledge and ideas into solutions. In order to accomplish this uh, mission, the uh, CIAR operates under eight pillars of activities, and I'll just list them up for you and we'll talk about them a little bit more in detail. And so the first being industry and community relations, then uh, research uh, commercialization, intellectual property protection, entrepreneurship development, business incubation, global business acceleration, customized training, and uh, community outreach. With respect to industry and community relations, the, the CIAR creates a 
team approach that, that assists in the business of applied research, that allows faculty and students the opportunity to focus on the research itself. So some of the things that the CIR does is uh, project scope and budget creation, contract negotiations, and project management assistance. As another pillar of activity, uh, the CIR I are also assisted in the IP identification and commercialization of uh, research outcomes. And some examples of that that we currently have are the two faculty student uh, commercialization opportunities as well as two potential patent opportunities. And even our staff are involved with um, projects and, and the like. So a number of things are going on there. Another example of uh, uh, commercialization opportunities uh, created by a faculty member at, at uh, Concordia, uh, Dr. Conrad Van Dyke who's an associate professor of uh, literature and language, he uh, developed a, a tool for um, teaching his students his essence of grammar. That's now become a not-for-profit uh, business that is uh, going out to a larger audience. The next pillar of, the, of uh, opportunity here is community outreach. Uh, the CR assists in the creating opportunities to engage the local community by hosting events, uh, collaborating with uh, CRE uh, uh, faculties and centers, uh, to create community partnerships and developing uh, the business develop opportunities. In the area of customized training, we found that many organizations uh, look to a credible and trusted partner to develop and deliver customized training solutions that provides relevant education and return investment for organizations. So uh, through the CIR, CUE offers uh, industry and corporate training as well as uh, executive education in areas such as enterprise risk management and ethics. Entrepreneurship development is a very exciting area for CUA given the fact that a recent study has suggested that almost half of graduating students would like to start their own businesses. So the CIR assists those students in creating those businesses uh, through an entrepreneurial or experiential opportunities in lunch and learn seminars, workshops, network opportunities, and A100 mentorship and the like. So I'd like to tell you a quick story about a, uh, an entrepreneurship uh, uh, success of one of our students. I had met as a student named, his, his name was Irshad Sharif, at one of our uh, events, and he had a great idea and the desire to actually to, uh, create a business, but lacked that knowledge and the mentorship to be able to move forward. So with our assistance, he was able to uh, create his business and launch it successfully as of last month. And so, craft app, just as a aside, is an artificial intelligence enabled application to uh, uh, strengthen or uh, the community in the Alberta craft brewing industry. So here he is uh, competing at a, uh, an event and he, was, he plays very, very well. Business incubation, which you see will be in the bottom portion of, of this uh, uh, building, uh, will have a, a goal of an incubator is to create a one-stop shop for youth entrepreneurs to explore their untapped potential in an environment that is really supportive and nurturing. And finally, many start businesses might be at the stage where in, in order to continue to grow, they actually need to uh, compete globally, but have lack the expertise to do so. So the Global Business Accelerator function uh, that we'll be offering will give uh, these businesses knowledge, training, and opportunity to network and uh, move forward and, and help business, business grow uh, internationally. So let's, let's change gears now a little bit and talk about the spaces for the CIR in the new building. And so breaking the mold and doing things differently, you need to take a step back and have a look at things in a, a, through a different lens. So there'll be a dedicated thinking space that will allow students and faculty to uh, look at real world solutions and problems. Taking that a step further, another opportunity would be the applied research place. Once you know, these ideas are, are uh, imagined, they need to be put into solutions. So that's what the Applied Research Space will provide uh, an opportunity for students and staff and uh, faculty work side by side on, on community issues and problems. Once these uh, applied research problems have been developed then, and our business uh, ideas have been imagined, the next opportunity is to look at going into the CIR entrepreneurship spaces. Those spaces uh, will take the form of the open entrepreneurship uh, space as, as well as a business incubator and the global business accelerator space. So the open, op open op uh, entrepreneurship innovation space is going to be a very highly configurable space 
that will allow uh, inspiring entrepreneurs to meet and network and learn and uh, get guidance and training from seasoned entrepreneurs and learn more about the entrepreneurship process and potential opportunities to, to move forward. For those who are at the point of their entrepreneurship journey where they want to transition from the open op entrepreneurship innovation space to perhaps or uh, out of their basement or off the corner of the desk, there will be some physical space available to them. And that will include four spaces to rent. Uh, there will be three two-person offices and one one-person office. But space, as we know, is not the only uh, requirement to develop a successful business. The business incubator and accelerator services that we'll have will also include uh, access to uh, business services such as a receptionist, uh, internet, photocopiers, printers, uh, business to business collaborations, applied research project assistance, and an introduction to angel uh, investors and VC funders. So you might ask, why is this CSRI building so important to the mission of the uh, CIR? Well, uh, Concordia has envisioned that the uh, CIR is to be the hub of the innovation in response to community re requests to have access to services and resources that are nimble and responsive. So these new spaces will, be, will provide that physical space to be able to enable industry collaboration and the development of the next generation of our uh, global entrepreneurs. So in conclusion, let the CIAR open the, uh, the doors to success by connecting you to the new spaces in the CSRI building where we can assist you with creating meaningful connections with the CUE, developing research projects that meet your needs and or uh, providing uh, business incubation and global business acceleration services. So on that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. David Murray. I would like to invite uh, the presenters now um, to just stand here. And also the president, Tim Norman, please, Dr. Norman. Um, because we don't have much time, but a few questions we may have from the audience to the occupants of this building who are driving the building with all the students and all the professors and the community partners. So I would like to invite you to bring questions to any of those uh, areas that we have seen here or to the present. Any question? There we go. Oh, oh we have a few. One here. Thank you for all the presentations, they were wonderful. Um, I have a question about the Indigenous Centre. I'm wondering how the Indigenous Centre here at Kew would differ from other Indigenous Centres, for example, I think Norquist has one and maybe you have a... That's a good question. I think it, um, its approach is recognize the integration of Indigenous knowledge within the Centre itself and how that extends out into the uh, campus community. Uh, it's, it's more meant to be that uh, relationship process, as, as I was talking about treaties, it's about presenting our knowledge as a part of what the curriculum is here at the, uh, on campus and the different uh, faculties that we're working with. So I think it's going to be a lot more integrated in how we support um, not just our students, but the faculty and staff here when they're looking for knowledge and information as well. Question, there was one here. Thank you. Yeah, and I very much enjoyed all the presentations as well. Um, just my question, I guess, quickly. As we all know, the United Federation of Planets is a diverse group of individuals. And we just heard a diverse group of presentations uh, for what's going to be a very dynamic center under the leadership of our starship captain, Mormon, here. And I was wondering if any of the speakers could speak to how each of your units will collaborate effectively with other units in that building. Right? I think that's a really key thing that's, that's quite special about our CSR. Really good question. And I'm actually very, very excited about the, the opportunities that are coming up, uh, especially with respect to entrepreneurship and business development, those type of activities and working with Lewis and, and the Indigenous area to uh, help Indigenous students and, uh, and youth with their entrepreneurship needs and, and move some things forward. So I'm really looking forward to that. If we look at things with respect to applied research, uh, you know, Sanders S Lab and uh, certainly the, uh, the labs and, and the expertise that uh, Patrick has in his areas will be um, instrumental 
and helping that applied research activity move forward. I just wanted to stress that already we're beginning to collaborate across our different areas and the fact that we have now a physical space will even intensify this collaboration further and we're all committed to a sense of community work as well. I think that also is what drives this and I have to commend the vision of the President and Senior Administration to even think about having this building built. So I'm very thankful as a research that we will actually be able to house this research and work better with the community as well. And as uh, you saw from my schematic diagram, the science laboratories are all next to each other. The proximity of those, so we have a lot of our interdisciplinary research collaboration and also um, as uh, Dr. Song has said, uh, we are already collaborating with our public health. We are already collaborating between our uh, chemistry and our uh, biology and environmental science. So we have lots and lots of uh, um, collaborative uh, endeavor to make the CSRI uh, indeed uh, a spaceship that's going to take us to, to the next level. Um, I can just reiterate the same point, but uh, perhaps adding to it um, our own perspective from um, the, uh, what we do in psychology. I think we have been working with both the Public Health Central uh, Department as well as with David uh, for some time, and uh, our collaboration has been focusing on uh, developing strategies within the community and making sure that those strategies actually they have a business purpose to them and as well as with the uh, uh, indigenous uh, section of our team, we have been working to advance a uh, indigenous strategy. Of course, with Patrick, Patrick is the lemony member of our uh, team, so, uh, so we haven't yet figured out, but what I can say is that uh, we are uh, developing a uh, uh, sort of interest in the area of uh, uh, neuros neuroscience that will in fact uh, cross over into the uh, science faculty and uh, that I foresee as uh, the new development for our psychology department. Question here? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It is? You can hear Thank you, everyone. Uh, this question is related to IPRS and the vision of how you are going to create this beacon for existing services in the community and how you're going to link with those services. The existing services in the community are in fact quite important for us. What we are um, trying to basically address falls in the area of service gaps. It's our understanding that as uh, health system started shifting in terms of financing over the uh, past 20 years or so, uh, especially in the area of mental health, uh, there seems to be a uh, number of areas that are in need of uh, service analysis to see, in fact, uh, what kind of service gaps are there and how universities, especially clinics attached or institutes attached to universities, can make a contribution in that area. We have done some of that service analysis gaps with our community partners, and we are happy to say that not only we have done the a service gap analysis with our community partners, but we have planned to use the resources that we have uh, to make a measured, focused, targeted uh, contribution in the area of uh, overlapping uh, the services that are out there and closing the gaps. That's what I can say. We, we are unfortunately coming to the end of our time, and I would like to have perhaps uh, Tim Norm, uh, the presence here with you. <laughs> Sure. I mean, um, I'm a Star Wars guy, not a Star Trek guy. And as we know, the two, the two can never live uh, comfortably together. But um, I will say that, that the force um, is really what binds us here. Um, and uh, the, the, the different aspects of this building um, is it, uh, not accidental. It's not, we didn't just sort of throw them in and, and hope that it, that it would all work together. We've put quite a lot of thought uh, into the, the sorts of um, research elements that will comprise this building. And 
um, as, as uh, our speakers pointed out, the proximity uh, to one another uh, of these sort of complementary, in some ways, research areas, I think will be really key to uh, having that centre become a really vibrant and, and uh, a great space for Edmonton and, and uh, of course, for Concordia. So uh, I, I just wanted to kind of um, uh, uh, be sure that everyone, everyone uh, knew that, that that's uh, the reason for the, for the sort of eclectic seemingly um, a collection of, of uh, areas in here. So uh, we do need um, money. This doesn't happen by itself. So please, uh, I'd uh, like to encourage you to, if you haven't already, contribute to the Accelerate campaign. Uh, as you can see, it's going to a very worthwhile uh, cause and, and worthwhile effort here at Concordia. Uh, but I'd like to close by just thanking each of our speakers. You did a great job. Petra Kuchers are fantastic. They're so interesting. Well done. So thank you, everyone.